ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to That Great Business Show, episode 35 of Ireland's Best Podcast, brought to you as always by the world's best shaving oil company, DeFactoShave.com. I'm Clonal Moran. On this episode, we have someone who believes there can be too much politeness with staff. And we have a hair extensionist. Yes, it is a thing, but that guest started off life working in corporate law, so that's some pivot. And we have a business that makes a business out of keeping staff in your business healthy and happy. Our website is thatgreatbusinessshow.com. But the best place to talk to us, we're finding, is on LinkedIn. So please follow our page there and we'll give you more tips, insights, and of course, our weekly sneak peek of what's coming up on the podcast. Remember, you can still be in with a chance to win 5% of Listoke Distillery in County Louth. Listen back to distillery founder Brona Conlon on episode 34 to find out how cool that would be. And you can buy a £50 sterling ticket for the raffle on a website called raffle, R-A-F-F-A-L-L dot com. My first guest today is fascinating at many levels. A self-made multimillionaire, he started work at 15 and went on to build and sell a number of companies, one of them for half a billion dollars. That side of Norman Crowley's great story is really well told on various other podcasts, including one by D. Reddy at Intercom and by Tyg Enright on Joe.ie. They really are well worth a listen. So, in the spirit of doing things differently, as we always try to do on that great business show, I'm hoping to glean some different business lessons from Norman Crowley, whose no bull attitude to business I find very refreshing. Welcome to That Great Business Show, Norman Crowley. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. First question, left of field. Is Clannacilty the most beautiful place in the world? Hmm. Uh, it's like Pat Short said, it'd be a great country if you could roof it. <laughs> <laughs> Clannacilty is one of the most gorgeous places mm. in the world. Mm. And why do I mention Clannacilty? Well, I guess I'm from there. Uh, proud Clannacilty man. So... Um, yeah, although when I left Clonakilty, I sound like an old man now, but when I left Clonakilty... You're only 47, is it? Uh, 50. 50, oh, 50 sorry. Yeah. I was looking at old <laughs> videos of you. <laughs> but um, I, uh, yeah, when I left Clonakilty in the kind of mid-80s, it was pretty run down, and like a lot of places in Ireland. Ireland you know, was run down in yeah, the 80s. 100%. It was grey, black yeah. and white and grey, nothing else. No, and I... I guess about 10 years ago, I realised that Clannacilty was becoming like the Riviera because I was driving up the main street and you couldn't find a car space for Mercedes and all of that. And the sun was shining and the shops were great. And Clann has really turned itself around. But it's kind of, a lot of it's down to a lot of kind of heroes in Clannacilty, people who created amazing shop fronts. And just there's a great sense of community around Clann. Like, I don't know, did you see... Uh, when you were <laughs> researching that, like we did this thing last year with the Chamber of Commerce in Clannacilty called Cool Clan. We got an RTE down for, and they broadcast the news from there. And we did all these environmental projects. And like, you really got to see the spirit of Clannacilty, like just the community and how fast they mobilize and how uh, aligned they were, you know. So yeah, it's a fantastic spot. Yeah. Good. You said that you gave the right answer there. I'm actually <laughs> hoping once lockdown finishes, I'm going straight down there because I have something booked down there, believe it or not. I have, as I, uh, you have inferred, been looking back at your career. I won't go back into it because anybody who wants to say, as I say, it's all up there up on, on the Google machine. You now, since 2008, I think, <laughs> have founded Crowley Carbon. You have 27 com- companies. If we spent one minute on each, we wouldn't have enough time on this. So I just wanted, I loved some of the many things, because you are a talker, that you said on the many videos that I watched of you. Staff issues, um, too much politeness. How about that? Talk to me about too much politeness in uh, with staff. Yeah, well, I suppose it's nice to be polite, but what hap- what's happened in business hugely is we go into business speak all the time. We don't have a problem. We have an issue. We don't have a fuck up. We have whatever other word we use. And so people have stopped communicating with each other. And if you've got a problem, you don't let somebody know. 
you know, it's all double meaning business speak. You know, you were talking about LinkedIn and LinkedIn has its uses, but it's just full of BS a lot of the time. And so what we find with our clients and with ourselves is we're just, we as time goes on, we're just very blunt. If you look at any of our marketing speak, it's all much blunter, much more straightforward. And we just find it's much more relaxing in work to be like that. And there's two things, right? You can be impolite or direct and still mean well, you know. So you can say, I have a problem with how you did that, but I don't have a problem with you. I just have a problem with how you did that. And people, what we found over time is it's just extremely empowering for people because they're just like, they know that we're not out to get you, that we completely have your back. But also they know that, you know, they're covered in everything they do. Um, and that if there's a problem, there's a problem. They can tell us what the problem is. They can just move on then from the problem. And so, and I, I think we used to be kind of unique in that, but I think there's a lot of companies now are starting to operate that way. But even now, you're probably talking 1% of companies operating that way. You're fascinating to me at many levels because I'm listening to you again now and you're self-taught, I think. Where mm -hmm. did you learn all of this stuff? Well, everywhere. Like, I think one of the keys to happiness is learning all the time. And so, like, from the time I was tiny, my mum and dad taught me stuff. And my dad taught me how to weld when I was 12, which is how I set up my first business. And so, and even now we find learning fascinating. Um, you keep referencing again on all of these podcasts and all the we, but we're talking about Norman Crowley, whose name is above the door. <laughs> Of Crowley or Crowley Carbon. Do you call yourself Crowley or Crowley? Uh, Crowley. I don't Crowley. really care, but most people call me Crowley. <laughs> Might be the only thing they call you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've called me a lot worse than they may have been right. <laughs> so yeah, no. You um, keep saying we, but it's you. Well, no, it's not me at all. It's I, like, listen, <laughs> nobody could have had the drive or success without being you. Yeah, but like if you take anything we do, that's great. If you take our car business... It's down to our engineering team. It's down to our design team. But you yeah. had to go and be you're mad enough, and I still think you're mad enough about the cars <laughs> because I know something about cars. Is uh, uh, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> I said to myself, no, stick to the brief. <laughs> so back to cars your, are a lot of fun, by the way. <laughs> I love. I'm sorry, you are talking to uh, just somebody who adores cars. Back to the. Mm -hmm. I, I want you to teach your way of thinking to our many, many, many listeners. Yeah. Um, well, look, there are many aspects to the way of thinking. Um, like there's our beliefs about th the things that we're doing. There's our beliefs about how to build a team. Um, you know, so it's about, but the we is important, right? It is, you know, if I ended my business career and it was just, I was a great fella, that would be pointless. And especially now, I'll give you one example of we that, we've become obsessed with lately in our business is um, like, I'm lucky enough to have made my money, right? So now it's about, the we is genuinely about how can we hire somebody in and build a life for them in our business? So if somebody starts off as a university graduate, how can we take them all the way through to their first house, their, you know, their partner, their kids, um, their kids going to college even now, you know, and and building a life for them. Because if we can build a life for them, they will build their life around us. And if they build their life around us, then we've created another massive asset for the business. That was know? the way the Japanese used to run their lives, wasn't it? Is mm. that you kind of get a buy-in. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's been argued that that's not necessarily always healthy because there, there is that interdependence or codependence. As your, yeah. your, as your psychologist or your psychotherapist might tell you. <laughs> we like a bit of codependence though. <laughs> and like somebody, my wife said, my wife works in the business and she said to me recently, oh, something about John Crowley or John Murphy's second child. And I was like, John Murphy had a child. <laughs> and then I realized like, like I look back and he'd, you know, he'd bought a house, he'd, he'd built a family, he'd met somebody and that's wonderful for us. Like it's, they've built their entire life around us and they've been promoted and they're a manager now. And that's, it just becomes so important to us and people leave and people don't work out and that's business. But our main thing is building a life for these people. And actually the bigger the businesses grow, 
it's actually building a serious life and making people into millionaires um, and then relying on the fact that we can do that, you know. You mentioned there, sometimes it doesn't work out. And I just got that feeling when I was watching these videos of you that I'd say it could be a bit abrupt when it doesn't work yeah. out. Talk to me. Tell me I'm fired. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we fire very fast in our business actually now. Because if you're trying to find people that suit the organisation, you, you know, you don't know from an interview. And we've read all the interview techniques and the sophisticated and we've heard about how brilliant Google are at hiring and all that. Frankly, it's all a lot of rubbish. Like, you have no idea when you're interviewing somebody what they're like and how they're going to perform in our environment. So the kindness that we can do somebody is if it doesn't work out, we'll tap them on the shoulder incredibly quickly and just say, this isn't working out. And like, you know, one of our CEOs today said that he was going to let somebody go. And I, like, we're sad, but actually on the other hand, we're like, I said to him, I'm so pleased you're so decisive. Because if you look at so many corporations, they tolerate mediocrity. And the problem with tolerating mediocrity is other people who are brilliant in your organization can see you tolerating mediocrity. So why should they work hard, work the weekend, do whatever we're asking them to do if they see us tolerating somebody else who can't be bothered, you know? And it takes a long time to build up that organization. And frankly, for a lot of years, I was crap at doing it. Um, but now that we've become good at building an organization, it's you see the power of it. Because then if somebody is a real go-getter, they want to join that organization. They've heard about it and they want to join because they know that they can succeed in that organization. If interviewing is such a bad mm. experience, mm. how do you choose people? Um, we, well, I think we're getting better at spotting things. Like an example, recently we hired somebody and she you know, she'd come up in a very harsh environment and she had succeeded um, to get to the position she was in. Um, and you could tell that she had a lot of the personality traits. But what we do now much more in an interview, a bit like yourself, is we challenge, you know, we say... And then, you know what? I never challenge. So I'm more <laughs> interested. If I start challenging, you'll just say no or yes or no. Well, you know, I like doesn't, a good, it doesn't get me anywhere. I, I like a meaty... Um, I like a meaty interview where, you know, um, where we can really get into it. And uh, Good. But, um, because <laughs> I, otherwise... It's let, me, just, let me roll up my sleeves here. Yeah, <laughs> like I was listening to an interview at lunchtime by a politician and they just trot out the platitudes. Like, like, that's and, a waste of time for waste everybody. Time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I just, I put on a podcast because I just can't be arsed listening to that, you know. But um, so it, it's it's important to, to get into the truth. Yeah. So uh, you haven't answered my question, actually. When, which is, how do you hire? I mean, if somebody's listening to this and they'd love to work with you, mm. and I, um, I could be amongst them, because I, I really like what I've uh, read yeah. about you, is how do I get in the door and what should what little boxes should I be ticking? Yeah, it's, you know, we can spot kind of gameplay, so really it's about being yourself, you know. it's Well, first of all, how you get in Did you is, spot it there? Is we list well? I'm I'm constantly looking out for it. like we we advertise jobs and then people come in and and really it's about authenticity. It's about are you buying into us um, and have you made the effort before you came in to understand who we were? Um, because the thing about working with us too is, you know, we can teach you the stuff you need to know. What we can't do is make you a different person than you actually are, and so. Really, we're trying to figure out who are you. Yeah. I suppose, and uh, we better explain exactly what Carbon Crowley does do, yeah. because that would help, because I'm going to yeah. ask you another question after that. Yeah, well, now um, Crowley Carbon has changed, so it's no longer actually. So what it is now is what's called Cool Planet Group, because as you said, it's a group of 27 companies around the world. Um, and what we we believe in something very different than most people believe, which is we believe we believe that Climate change is the most existential problem in the world. A lot of people believe that. But radically, we believe that climate change will largely be solved by 2030. Um, and so our companies um, all mirror to fixing that. And to fix climate change, you need to do three things. You need to fix energy, transport and food. Um, if you fix energy, transport, food, 
then you fix climate change largely. And so the businesses we have are aligned to those three things. Talk to me about the food because I was uh, I like the way that you you give the extreme example of uh, the greens because you're not a oddly enough you're not a fan of the greens you're going to tell yeah. me oh no I love them but in fact you don't <laughs> no I, I I don't agree with a lot of their politics strangely and it's weird that we would have a you know that we want to solve climate change and yet we don't agree with the greens but there's a lot of there's a lot of wishing that goes on in traditional green and traditional climate change. Like you wish the world was different than it was and you think we should all sing Kumbaya and be socialists. Um, But actually the world doesn't work like that. And so if we're going to solve climate change, which is too much CO2 in the atmosphere, then wishing ain't going to make it work. And that's where we disagree. And, you know, you know, there's even policies like people should take public transport a lot more. No. Because t- public transport not isn't that pleasant. We take pub- public transport because we have to. But if people were given a choice, they wouldn't take public transport. It's kind of smelly. It's kind of not that nice on a rainy day. Um, and if we had a choice, we would sit in an air-conditioned pod uh, on our own or with a mate. And it would be a nice environment. Um, and then we would get to where we wanted to go. And likewise with everything. It's like we should use reusable bottles well, we should, but actually a reusable, if I want to drive from Dublin to Cork, I need to bring three or four reusable bottles with me. I need to remember to fill them and clean them and all that. Actually, a plastic bottle is a great solution to that, but a plastic bottle is a horrible pollutant. So what is the solution? Solution is a plastic bottle that's made out of algae that when you're finished drinking water out of it, you can fire it into the ocean and it just dissolves. And to a lot of people, that's a shocking thing to say, right? But actually, that is the solution. And it's by the way to solve climate change is to call a spade a spade and just say, this is how you fix this thing, right? And not wishing that people, humans were different, right? Because that's what we've been trying to do for 40 years and we've, we've singularly failed to achieve anything by doing that. That is uh, music, absolutely, or like the hallelujah choir to me <laughs> about all this stuff because you, mm. and again, um, everybody listening, please go on to the videos. There's far more of this and it's uh, we don't have time, unfortunately, mm. just to go into every bit of it. But you really lay into it sometimes. Mm. The, uh, the the company, One of your companies, you play a very big game because you can make a massive difference financially to corporations. Talk me through that one. Yeah, so that's the original Crowley Carbon business, which is it's now been renamed Clarity, actually. Um, because it's it's become very software led, and here's the shocker in the world, right? And this is again a lot of time you never hear the green lobby talking about this, or climate change lobby, or Greenpeace. The world wastes four trillion dollars, or sorry, the world spends four trillion dollars a year in energy. Okay, that's how much we spend. We waste three of the four trillion dollars every year, right? So. And by that, what do you mean? Like, I mean, we literally, we dig this energy out of the ground and then we piss away three quarters of it or three out of, yeah, three quarters of it. You gave the example of a car. Yeah, a car is hysterical. So I drove in here in a car. Thankfully, it was an electric car. But like, if I drove in here in a diesel car and I also have a diesel car, then I would have wasted 98% of the primary energy that I, I used just to get here today, right? So that's a shocking, shocking statistic. If and we, break that down? Like, so internal combustion engine is only 30% efficient. Then it's not just moving me, it's moving the leather seats and the, and the radio and the whole flipping shebang and the fuel tank. And then there's all this kinetic energy wasted. Like the electric car I came in here was 92% efficient. And the electricity from that came from the sunshine yesterday in our house. So that process, I don't know what Get it away. was. Get away, did you actually charge it off? Yeah, 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 electric, yeah. all yeah. the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Something we did during COVID was just, excuse my, I curse a lot, we solared the shit out of the house. And so now, since the end of February, we haven't used any imported electricity. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Super. And by the way, that's not do good or Norman, right? That's like a financially, and this is what I mean, without any grants from government, without any lobbying, without anything, we installed solar panels on the house. It was a four-year payback, which is a 25% return on our money. Can't get that in Bank of Ireland, right? And then we're like, it was just a financially advantageous thing, complete no-brainer to do that, right? So that's 
the thing. We have wrecked the messaging around climate change for years now. It's always been a message of we must do it out. We must suffer. We must turn the thermostat down and wear an extra coat. What a load of shit. Like, frankly, it's like we we have the technology nowadays to solve every single one of these problems. We just need to look at it differently and talk about it differently and stop treating the general public like they were children and give it to them straight what they need to do. You, I, again, I'm a fan, obviously, but you need some people to champion this for you. You are a pal of Richard Branson. Yep. Anybody else, would didn't Elon Musk or any of these lads take yeah. it on, listen to you and try to do it yeah. your way? I'll call it your way. Yeah, well, Elon and I would be very aligned. Are you pals? Uh, I know him. I wouldn't say Can you pick up the phone to him? Uh, I can get hold of him if I need to. Um, That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can get hold of anybody if you need to and if you have the right thing to say. But um, he he would be streets ahead of us in the beliefs around this. You know, he's much smarter than we are. He's, he's a chaotic mess. In fact, he's much more chaotic than we are too. But he, you know, he's just a deeply impressive character. Um, and yeah, he would be aligned in what we believe. Richard Branson would be aligned in what we believe too. Um, and it's just a radical new way of looking at this problem. But also, like a lot of the other problems in life get solved by solving climate change. I'll give you an example, right? Food. So how do you solve... Meat's a big problem, right? Because... And people try and sugarcoat meat, but a cow... I grew up on a dairy farm. A cow is just a useless article. It's a 2% converter of food to food. So a cow eats food and then wastes 98% of it and then gives you the rest as food. Like, what a laughable joke, right? And, and they don't even look that nice. Um, I and, love milk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and even milk, right, is is a joke. And nutritionally, it's got all sorts of complexities. But So how do you fix that problem? Well, cellular agriculture. You take a cell from an animal... You put it into a bioreactor, you photocopy it a million times, and then you get a burger. And it's using 98% less greenhouse um, or 98% less CO2, like 94% less water. It's just a fantastic solution. And the and, secret is heme. Did I learn that from well, you? Well, heme is, in a meatless product, heme is the secret ingredient. Um, so heme is just a protein that tastes like blood, hemoglobin, um, and makes a burger taste more like a burger. But even more advanced than a meatless product is actually a meat product, but that's made in a lab, right? And then people say, oh, it's fake meat and all that. And I wouldn't like that. And I prefer my meat to be natural. Like, have you been to an abattoir? Like, this is not natural. Like, this is fairly disgusting, right? And so, and have you analyzed meat? Like, it, you know, it's not entirely healthy for us, right? And so there are so many solutions. But then the amazing thing, if we get to cellular meat, which we will get to by 2025, and nothing, by the way, will stop this. Like, this is economics, it's science, it's happening. But if we get there, the most radical thing then is you'll see a 90% reduction in the cost of meat, okay? So electric cars lead to a 90% reduction in the cost per mile, right? Energy, solar, will lead to a 90% reduction in the cost of energy. Then cellular ag, cell meat, will lead to a 90% reduction in meat. So People what? who are growing meat or mm -hmm. cows at the moment should get that out of there. So, Well, the, the people say to me all the time, what about the farmers? But farmers aren't making money. Right. So they're barely holding on. Right. So like we have to find like it's a separate problem. You can't keep going as we are with our agricultural system anyway, because, yes, big food companies are making money, but farmers aren't making money. They haven't made money for a long time. You think big. What is mm. what are you thinking big about the future for farming here? If it is about to implode, yeah. what would you do with our beautiful, beautiful island? Like a whole load of stuff. And this is where I would align with the Greens. We need to plant more trees, right? And you might say, you might say, well, sure, that's what everyone says. But actually, a lot of, if you take beef farmers, for instance, below a certain scale, like small beef farmers, they are better off planting trees. You get a 7% return on your money, which they don't get in beef farming. Like scale beef farming, big beef farming, they seem to make a little bit of money, all right. But the smaller ones don't. So plant trees, um, and then bigger ones is we can do artisan food. Like every 
town in Ireland practically at this stage is producing artisan food, including meat and stuff like that. And that needs to scale. And the government should be encouraging them to scale that more because that's everybody wins out of that. Right. And then we will have I'm not anti meat and cow and all that. Like we will have beef steers here in 50 years and you will have an amazing steak, just not at the volume we're doing right now. We can't keep going. To give you an idea, if we wanted to feed everybody that's going to be in the world by 2050 and we wanted to give them meat uh, the way we do it today, we need seven planet Earths. Okay. So if somebody says to me, I don't agree with you and I don't like your politics, I go, fantastic. Where are we going to get the six planets from? I thought you were going to use another F word there. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what's on the videos. Yeah. <laughs> you spend an awful lot of time thinking about this. Yeah, pretty much all the time that that's available. Um, that but you're also running your 27 com- companies and you had these previous companies mm. and you're a busy boy. Yeah. And look, you know, we're busy because we're what's called mission led. We're not, you know, rule number one in our businesses is make money because you need to make money to pay the wages and to grow. Uh, rule number two, cool the planet. And we say, don't confuse one with two and don't confuse two with one. So in other words, don't do the second one without making money. Don't make money without cooling the planet. Yeah. One of the other things that I read about you, heard about you saying was, uh, I will, somebody asked you, why did you sell one of your businesses? And you got sick of it. You got sick of businesses. You're yeah. a flippity gibbet or whatever they call those. <laughs> well, things. I think as well, what happens now when I get bored with them is I... The reason you get bored with it is because it's not doing the mission. I think I've learned that. So if if you're sick of it, it's because it's not achieving the mission you set out for it to do. What I've learned in the last 10 years is if it continues to achieve the mission, then you don't get bored with it. Um, Certainly not if the mission is big enough. And the other thing is, if you look at what happened in, in this business, we set it up in 2008 as an energy business. Now, Alan Kyo runs our energy business um, and we have an automotive business and a food business and an education business. And so what happens is I get to do now the next thing, which is the problem with entrepreneurs all the time is, you said it earlier, is we get 40 ideas by the time we get out of the shower in the morning. And, you know, 39 of the ideas are terrible. But um, now we have the capability and the scale and the skill set to follow our ideas. And that's a big that's a big advantage. And when you talk scale, are you talking that you have access to the cash or yeah. are you talking about a headcount? Uh, both. Um, but how, like, big, how big a headcount have you got at the moment? Um, we kind of don't count it anymore because it's like, I don't like defining businesses by revenue and all that. To give you an idea, our energy business has about 100 people. Our car business by the end of this year will have about 150 people and then our education group. So I don't add it up anymore because it's too... All of a sudden, you judge a business by how many people it has. And the other thing about nowadays with people is a person nowadays does the work of 10 people 10 years ago. So judging anymore by how many people is is not a great metric, we find. But um, you are driven by cash. One yeah. of the things uh, that I heard you say was that you saved a company, was it $200 million? Mm-hmm. And how much did they pay you for the privilege of saving them that amount of money? Yeah. You're not shy about charging, are you? Well, look, if you How much gonna, did you charge them? If you're going to... Actually, we didn't charge them as much as we saved them. Um, we, no, <laughs> oh, of course you didn't. Otherwise, I wouldn't do no, it. No, no. Well, the I don't numbers, know the well, to give you the exact numbers, that we saved them $100 million annually. It took us three years. And over the three years, we charged them $50 million. That's a lot of money. No, but look how much they're saving. Like it's a, it's like uh, fifty million smackaroonies, yeah. one contract. Yeah, but gorgeous, like gorgeous but compared business. to the contracts we're doing now, that's smaller. And you you're know? not going to ever IPO again because you hate other outside investors. Um, I, I like my investors, but an IPO is not the most efficient way to grow. We find that accessing private capital is much better. So, a third of our business is owned by a twenty-seven billion euro French fund. Uh, called T2. And uh, and we just love working with people like that. They share our vision um, and we can just work together and we can just access capital much faster by doing that than going public. Yeah. What's the big vision now? I mean, you've done it. You've done it 10 times uh, at this stage. We, I don't feel like, I think we're only getting revved up, to be honest with you. And, and on two levels, one is 
the mission were a lot. Look, solving climate change, we're a long way off the mission, right? And then... And you're not going to do it single-handedly. No. Actually, just no. on the, that mm. one, because I loved another one that you had, was mm. that you said that, was it the country, this country, the government spends 600... Yeah, a million on their own energy. That's And then you can save them. Oh, we could easily save them a third of it, probably half yeah. of it. Yeah. It's uh, an awful lot of money. It is, and they're moving very slow. Now, very, you know, I'm loath to give out to them at the moment because... You know, especially today, they've got a lot of issues around COVID and a lot of issues around... Um, but these everything. things can run in parallel. Well, of course they Business can. Does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, look, governments by their nature are going to go through massive change. This isn't just Ireland. This is every country in the world over the next 10 years because people have lost interest in governments and their ability to solve problems. And I, you're, we're going to see a big change in how governments establish themselves and run over the next kind of 10 years. Um, because if you take COVID in every sing- single country, governments have made an absolute mess of it. In almost every metric, they've made a mess of it. And so that's a great example of the problems that we're going to face as humans over the next 20, 30 years are going to be, they're going to come at us way faster. They're going to be much more unexpected and we're going to have to solve them way quicker. And yet all our governments are less capable of doing it now than they've ever been. So, Something has to give there. Yeah. I could spend the next couple of hours chatting to you because I just, I, I like what you say. I suppose we all like to hear people that we agree with. I have to ask you a final question. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? Please don't say Richard Branson. Uh, no, Ron, Richard is Richard is heading towards retirement, I guess, as well. Um, I think it would be Elon Musk, actually, as chaotic as he is. Um because he is just a singular force of nature. And needless to say, like Richard, he'd never work for anybody else. But if he would, then, you know, it would be him. Interesting that you said that uh, Richard Branson is heading for retirement. I don't think you can spell the word retirement, can you? <laughs> no, I have no notion of retiring ever. Yeah, My dad passed away two months before his 90th birthday and he was working a couple of weeks up until he passed. And so, yeah, no, retirement's not of interest, really. Norman Crowley, founder of, well, what are you calling yourself cool these days? Group. Cool Climate Group. All 27 companies. I presume you'll have another one by tomorrow morning. Thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. You're listening to That Great Business Show with Conal Moron and Jamie Heaslip. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com Do you know what happens to all those empty shaving foam cans? No? Well, 20 million of them are sent to landfill every year, and that's just in Ireland. It is a flaming disgrace, and it's completely unnecessary. One bottle of de facto shaving oil is the equivalent of 10 cans of shaving foam. Switching from foam to the world's best shaving oil is the simplest thing you could do to help keep our planet clean. DeFactoShave.com, saving the planet one shave at a time. Backing great women-led businesses on every show. That great business show. As a bald man, most things to do with hair go straight over my head. I was, however, intrigued when I read about a job called a hair extensionist. It is a real thing, I gather. My next guest used to work in corporate law, but that was a bit too exciting for her, so she chose a completely different career, training to be one of those aforementioned hair extensionists. That, in turn led to her setting up her own hair care and beauty business called King Hair and Beauty. Now, her products are stocked in over 200 outlets nationwide. As well as making her own makeup potions, she has also created her own hairbrush, the jewel, that's as in jewel in the crown, hairbrush. She is a one-woman dynamo, but the one thing that Samantha King would like is a business mentor. I will get onto that shortly, but first, Samantha King, founder and CEO of King Hair and Beauty. Welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. The world of corporate law couldn't keep you there. <laughs> the big checks, it was just too exciting or what? Yeah, do you know what? I always wanted to be in law um, since I was very, very young. It was an ambition that I had. Um, and I think maybe too much Ali McBeal had, uh, you know, poisoned my mind as to what it would be. Um, and I just found myself sitting, looking out the window, 
daydreaming about kind of entrepreneurial type things. I was always thinking about different business ideas and what I could do. And I just wasn't in love with it. Where did that come from, that idea uh, that I want to be in business? Do you know what? My dad um, has his own business. Ah, and That always explains it, you know. Yeah. And I grew up um, going around with him when he was pricing jobs and we were like hustling, you know, from really young. And I think I just saw it from very young. We all worked really, really hard from a young age. We were always, that was really instilled in us. And what was that family business? Um, building. Building, okay. Yeah, so they're cool. building contractors and still are. My brothers are also in the business. Down Wicklow Way. Yes. Down because, in Wicklow. Because that is where you are based. Yes, it is. I'm just in Wicklow Town. That's where our business is based. I'm literally just outside the town. That's where we live. Um, and it's beautiful. Absolutely fabulous down there. The Garden of Ireland. Indeed. And it truly is. Like, it is absolutely beautiful. We are um, just on the Port Road. That's where our warehouse is. And we love it down there. It's just so picturesque. But from there, you are growing a, well, hopefully, you've already done the national business. Yes. But you have gone international. Well, we have started. So in the last couple of months, we have been doing some orders ourselves to uh, America. Um, And this week, in fact, Australia. Um, And we're starting to kind of dot all over the place. Um, But we would love an amazing distribution company um, who can help us with that. That's kind of our next steps. Well, let me just cut in there because that is my opportunity to ask about Mm -hmm. why did you specifically mention to me that you cannot get a business mentor. I, yeah, I know, which is, it sounds crazy, but um, I've applied actually a couple of times and been unsuccessful. Um, and I think we're quite young in business. We're only technically, you know, two sets of accounts in, let's call it, because um, that's what everyone really wants to see. Um, so I think we aren't seen enough as like an established business yet um, and maybe a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, and we feel like we're standing on top of the, the mountain. We're ready to jump, but we just can't quite jump in because I need a mentor. I need someone to guide me. But surely somebody in the industry or was who was in the industry that you could just pick up the phone to them now? I mean, we've had, just off the top of my head, we've had um, Pamela Laird, we've had Joe Amazing. Brown, yeah, Amy fabulous. Conley. Yes. They're all massively successful. And I just saw uh, before I came into the studio that Joe Brown has been uh, very good to us again on LinkedIn. She is now, as we try to have everybody, part of Team GBS and we all try to back each other. You Amazing. You will get a mentor. I if I have so. to, If I have to go and beat them up myself, <laughs> what would you like them I to do? It. I just give me guidance, I suppose. So on like the next step. But so, you've only done it yourself. Maybe you don't need it. Well, do you know what? I never, ever think that I know it all. That's for sure. And I can tell you one thing. I have done an awful lot of learning as I go, as they say, learning on your feet. Um, I'm actually a professional at that now. If that was a career, that would be mine. Um, But it really teaches you and particularly the mistakes that you make along the way. Oh, we love mistakes. Talk to us about the mistakes because you're not going to tell me you woke up in the morning and you were selling a million in the afternoon. No, (laughs) No, it doesn't happen like that. And because um, we're kind of two into our third, almost into our third year, we would be considered, you know, an over overnight success but there's a lot of 365 days in those years um, and it's not an instant success. When I started I was literally in the front room of my home. I was doing all the hair extensions myself. I was waxing you know, everything. I won't get into that. Um, I was doing nails. I did everything for that first year. Um, and it's kind of a lonely place to be, you know. I was used to being in a corporate environment. Um, you know, I put on heels and a dress every day. And it's very different when you're putting on your gloves and your apron um, and you're totally alone and you've no one to interact with. But you are working for yourself at last. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, you know, people used to say to me, oh my God, would you go back? And I was like, never, ever, ever. And even on the darkest days, I wouldn't. Um, But it started to grow then. And after a year, I was able to invest in our own hair brand. Um, And that was huge because I was in that arena myself. And it's quite a niche. There's only a couple 
of suppliers in the country because it, the buy-in is quite expensive. You know, there's a lot of colours and you need to stock everything, of course. Now, I did preface this by saying, because I'm not just bald, I'm like a cue ball. <laughs> I know nothing about this. Tell me some of the ins and outs of what you're talking about. Yeah, so like it's literally, you know, it says what it is kind of thing. It's extending the natural hair. So it's like a little attachment in your hair um, and it gives you length and volume, uh, one of one or, or both, basically. But well, here's my big tip. Yeah. Get those for bald people. You will be <laughs> minted. We're, you wouldn't know what we're working on. <laughs> we might be able to grow hair where it's not growing at all. Um, but yeah, it's it's a, a niche market, obviously, within hairdressing. Um, but I often say that it's kind of like, you know, two people working on a house. You could have a plumber, an electrician. They're all working on the house, but one doesn't necessarily know what the other does. And um, so hairdressers are obviously doing the colour and the cuts and the styling. And then hair extensions are a speciality to themselves, really. Um, and there can be a bit of a crossover, but it is often a speciality that people go into kind of thing. And you have gone into it. So yes. how come you've managed, it appears, to make a very good, wait, you hear this? Cut, add it, get it cut, haircut. <laughs> Love a pun. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just personally, I wanted hair extensions myself when I started. Um, and I was in college at the time and I just thought, you know what? An L Nixer now would be ideal here to get me through. That's college. how Pamela, not Pamela, uh, that's how Amy Connolly started actually. Okay, yeah. amazing. Um, and my uh, then boyfriend, now husband, gave me an L loan to go and do the course. And um, I did the course because I wanted them myself. But I just thought if I spend all this money now on actually doing the course, sure, I could do my own. It's madness when I think of it now. Please, nobody do that. <laughs> but um, that's what I did. And I started doing friends and family. And I just felt that I had a kind of creative flair for it. And I felt good at it. I never felt good at law. I never felt great. It was always a struggle for me. You know, I never like skipped in the door thinking, God, I'm really making a good change here for somebody. Whereas when somebody comes into our salon and they go out the door, I can see the change in them. It's completely evident, not just physically, but emotionally, how they feel about themselves. You know, it really can affect a woman's confidence if her hair is maybe falling out or whatever the case may be. And we can change that in an hour. And it's just amazing to see. Because I think, as I understand it, there are three strands, get that again, so to <laughs> your business. You have your salon. Yes. You have the hair extensions as well, isn't that right? As in yes. you distribute and you also distribute other stuff primarily. Our retail to, products. To pharmacies, is it primarily? Uh, or pharmacy salons? and salons, actually. Okay. Yes. And then I have to get onto this hairbrush because yeah. the hairbrush is very interesting. You didn't quite patent a hairbrush, but yes. you have registered a design. Yeah, we have. And we actually have our name in the plastic. So um, you will often see questionable designs kind of floating around with just a name maybe laser printed on it or whatever it is. Um, and I wanted to go a step further because our brush is very well known. It's actually an award winning brush now and we're delighted how far we've brought it. And I really wanted to protect it because it's quite an iconic design. You won't see it, you know, anywhere else. Um, so that's what we did. And Now, I don't want to labour the point that I haven't touched the brush for many, many, many years. <laughs> yeah. But how can you be an award winning brush? So it basically, we have had an award from, um, you know, different brands that do awards. Ours is High Style Magazine. Um, they have awarded us, um, so basically by public vote. Um, wow. The public go on and vote for a number of products that they love in different categories. And um, we won for the brush, which is amazing. Because I think you told me that it's very, very good for people with specific type of hair problems. Isn't that right? Well, it's a great all rounder, to be honest. But children in particular, we were surprised that I never aimed it for children. Um, and mothers who have children that maybe um, are tactile sensitive or have um, other issues they have found it great because it doesn't pull or snag the hair. So especially for those who have um, maybe damaged hair, dry hair, it's not going to damage the hair in the same way your usual brush would. And it's actually curved with the shape of the head. So it's very comfortable. Because um, a lot of the time, like you're a brush, if it's too 
um, rough on the hair. It's going to pull it and snag it and damage and, you know, cause traction and stuff. So ours thankfully does not. And um, it's been a huge success for us. How can you go international? Because I'm, I know enough about, uh, certainly from this podcast, for, about the beauty business. It's very tough. It is very tough and we're only kind of at the start of that. So we um, do social media and um, I would like to think that we do it quite well. I have two amazing um, ladies who work with me on that. Um, and really that's like the whole basis of our business. Like when I started, um, you know, I was in my front room like and people were traveling to get their hair done and to train with me and all of those things from all over the country because they felt that connection. So we continue to do that with our social media. And um, we, I basically wanted to go down the influencer route. We hadn't done it before. It's the first influencer that we worked with, um, Erica Fox in Retro Flame, who was in New York and is just fabulous. I think she still is, is she? She still is, yeah. I I had to look her up. I didn't no, she wouldn't be quite my generation, but, <laughs> but she really has carved out a very interesting little business for herself. Amazing. There. Yeah, yeah, incredible. Um, And she, I think she's there seven or eight years now. When she went there, she was obviously working for a company. Now she's working for herself and she has built a whole career. Um, and we just adore her because, you know, she's very real. She's an Irish girl doing so well. I love to see Irish women succeed. I think it's incredible. Um, And her hair. Is. I think you will you will know is absolutely insane. It's just beautiful. It is gorgeous hair. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely stunning. And how because we always want to learn on that great business show. How are you using her? Why did you choose her? Yeah. Any tips for people who are looking at influencers? So I think the main thing is that the person you get reflects your brand. Um, I really felt that Erica was a good fit for me because she's personally somebody that I choose to follow. Um, and as you can imagine, a lot of my day is on social media. So when I get home in the evening, I'm not always like looking at everyone's stories because I've spent so long during the day. But Erica's always one that I go for because I love New York. I love her style. I love the fashion. I love that she likes kind of high end stuff, but she also is showing you kind of high street and our tagline is affordable luxury. Um, And she really kind of emulated that for me. But how do you work with her? Do you phone her up and say, or probably Zoom nowadays? Yeah. uh, Hi, Erica. Samantha here. Listen, let's talk through what you could do for us next or? Yeah, well, what I wanted. How do you shape it? Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Yeah. So um, uh, to be honest, because it was my first rodeo, I didn't really know. So I literally made contact with her and said we had actually saw her using our hairbrush. So we knew Ah. that she had somehow got it. um, And it turned out that her mom had been using it when she was home she like fell in love with it Home is in Kerry Home is in Kerry yes Um, and I just contacted her and said look I saw you using the brush Um, I'm not going to let on that I was really cool I was like I'm nearly dead I can't (laughs) believe it Um, because I actually follow you I was like totally fangirling and I just said to her I would love to send you some of our products and if you love them let's talk and if you don't that's fine but I'm not going to pay you just to say it's great. And thankfully, that's not how she works at all either. And it really comes across. So I think that's why she's an influencer that has such a good impact because people are like, you know, they know that she'll only talk if she absolutely loves something or she'll have been using it before. Um, Other than that, I think the influencer market, sometimes people are like, oh, hashtag ad. Well, oh, is it any good? You know, the consumer knows everything. Like they're, so educated, probably more so on hair and beauty than we even are. Um, so there's no point in trying to tell them that something is great if it's not. Now, we never are crass enough to go into the pounds, shillings and pence. We wouldn't go there <laughs> at all. We're a business show after all. But how, I'm not asking how much you pay her. Yeah. How do you figure out what it's worth your while? You know, do you say if you get a thousand hits or yeah. if you get, send me 500 people or something like that? How does okay. that work? So I basically asked her from other paid partnerships that she's doing, could she give me an idea of 
the type of sales that she has per month. And how we measure that is with a discount code. And then our Shopify store will tell us she's had a hundred, a thousand, a million, whatever it is. Um, and we can see exactly the revenue that that has generated. So she gave me an idea, you know, you're completely free to ask for their stats. It would be like you asking me for my CV if I was going for a job. Um, so you can totally do that. And um, I was able to see from that, okay, I would average that if things were going well for us, that we would do similar to maybe this brand and um, they're a similar price range or whatever. And then I was able to work out from that, you know, what we would um, need to kind of pay her, I suppose. Um, but they also do come with a price um, and they name their price. And uh, personally, I I would encourage negotiation. I'm in business, <laughs> you know. I think that's a euphemism. <laughs> I'd say... You're a good arm wrestler, are you? Well, oh, 100%. Like, my husband tells me I negotiate for a litre of milk. But, <laughs> but you did uh, say you're down yourself. We're going around. Oh, my God. He <laughs> is, like, number one hustler for stuff like that, literally. Um, and absolutely, that's where I get it from. There's no doubt about that. Um, he would be just king of negotiation now. Well, we leave Erica to one side, but yeah. if you were, if you started at 100, what would you normally get it down to? Would you get down to 50, down to 20? Um, Get it down to 10? It depends on it depends on what I'm negotiating for. But look, I always think there's a wiggle room. If somebody names the price, they are definitely expecting me to come back with something lower. And if not, like, I don't know, you're definitely not doing your negotiation right. Um, like, whatever you ask for is definitely not what you're expecting to get. Well, in my opinion, anyway. Which is a perfect opportunity for me to ask again. Yes. What... I was going to say, what influencer, what mentor, name me a mentor. I'll get onto that higher in a heartbeat in a second. Oh. But what mentor would you like? Like, do you want somebody who has 20 years in the beauty business? Or do you want somebody who's into international trade? Because you are going international now. Yeah. Do you want somebody who's a, a Shopify super expert? Um, No, what I would love is somebody who can... Um, direct me towards um, distribution, you know, that kind of area. Um, uh, I, I think that's what we're ready for. Um, I think it makes more sense for a distribution company to have six guys on the road rather than King Hair and Beauty to do that. Um, and I definitely think that that's where we need to go. But okay, here's my offer. I haven't spoken to him yet, but okay. our sponsor is uh, Tom Murphy of De Facto. Yes. And he's based in Mayo and he probably knows more about distribution, particularly to pharmacies because okay. he owns another company called Pamex. Yes, yeah. And on behalf of Tom, I'm unannounced for Tom, I can tell you. <laughs> I am going to say he will give you a call or you can give Amazing. him a call. Amazing. Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll start with that. Okay. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Now, we'll leave Tom to one side. We'll leave yes. a lot of people to one side. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? I'm going to say Sonia Deasy from uh, Pestle & Mortar. Because I, I just adore her brand. They have gone literally from strength to strength in, I'm going to say, a short space of time, which I know if she ever heard this, she would be like, oh my God, it was not a short space of time. <laughs> but um, I just think they're an incredible brand. I love that they're, you know, affordable luxury. I love their branding. It's so clean. Um, and I just think she's an incredible businesswoman. It's funny that you mentioned that about the kind of overnight success because just today we have posted on our LinkedIn, everybody go to our LinkedIn pages, all about people uh, who are overnight successes after, in John okay. Teeling's case, 35 years. Oh my when, goodness. When he, <laughs> when he thought of Teeling whiskey, it took him to sale, uh, to, when he finally sold, I think it was 35 years, I was really, uh, we were trying to work out there. Okay. And uh, like Joe Brown, She's yes. only 20 years in overnight success. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so. I'm going to need all of Joe's goods <laughs> if I'm going to be around here for another 20 or 35 years in business. Well, hopefully you will be and hopefully you will come back to us because you are now a member of Team GBS. Amazing. And Tom Murphy will be the first phone call, okay? That Brilliant. is Samantha King, founder. I like that. Founder and CEO of King Hair and Beauty. You're very lucky that you have the name King, of course. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it's I did steal that one from my husband. It's not my. Oh, what is the family name? What's your family Armstrong? Name? Ah, yes, okay. yeah. Uh, so listen, Samantha Armstrong King. King. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on that great business show. Thank you so much. 
Subscribe today to That Great Business Show on your favourite podcast platform, including Apple and Spotify. Kenobio, or That Great Business Show. Work It, spelt W or K I T, is a quietly successful company with offices in Ireland and the UK. Its business is that of cultivating healthy habits in work and life so that work clients can, quote, retain and strengthen a powerful working environment and a better future for everyone. The CEO behind the business with such lofty ideals is former Aer Lingus pilot Peter Jenkinson. And what better way to explain what the company does than to ask Peter to talk us through a case study. You don't have to name names, Peter, but just so that people understand, because it is somewhat complicated. May I say, first of all, though, welcome to that great business show, Peter Jenkinson. Connell, thanks to me, and appreciate uh, appreciate the uh, the opportunity to to work this with you, so to speak. And uh, like it, work and it, work, work it. Work. We try hard. We try hard. <laughs> and uh, I, I love I love the pitch, the lofty ideals. I might, might steal I might steal that from you. So, like it is, we are an interesting story. There's no there's no you know I, I I'm not bashful. I'm not bashful about that. Our origins our origins are in the aviation space, uh, as, as you said in the intro. Uh, I was a pilot for 35 years uh, with Aer Lingus. And at the latter stages of my career, when, when I realised uh, I wasn't indestructible and nor were my colleagues, and I realised that uh, it, would be, it would be prudent of us to, to have income continuance cover or loss of wings cover, uh, I set about getting that for myself and as an adjunct for my mates in, in Aer Lingus. This is and, what we call... A side hustle. But it's a very successful <laughs> yes, side hustle. hustle. Pray continue. Yeah, so yeah, side hustle is probably uh, I, I actually as a as a as a as a group we're probably we're probably we're probably not bad at it. I'm probably not the first pilot to be uh, to be in to be in here for sure. So um, so really having set up as almost from from selfish uh, for selfish reasons uh, acquired a policy that was relevant to the group. You know, after a very short space of time, and one A four on the one A four on the notice board, sometime in the nineties, sixty uh, percent of the pilots had had signed up for this uh, loss of wings or income continuance cover, and without having any rationale, rhyme, or reason at the time, but that was the first product. You know, which that was that was the the seminal moment, the kernel, the lesson that actually there's something you can do with with bringing a group together and leveraging leveraging that group. So for the first whatever it was, 15 years of our history, we were synonymous with discounts. That's what we did. We were really good at it. We aggregated uh, the employees and the members. So, so sometimes it's employee benefits, sometimes it's member benefits. We aggregated that total group to leverage discounts. And as I heard one of my colleagues saying, and we did it on everything from pizza to pension. And uh, it was a good line by by our director of solutions and one of the founders, Tom O'Driscoll, and I, I've quoted it a few times uh, since, and it does give you an impression of the breadth of, of product that we had. That's why I had to ask you to kind of give an explanation and mm. so maybe a, a living example, because it is all-encompassing. Yes. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, we regularly get asked by by potential clients, so how many, you know, who who do you have the discounts with? And if they're prepared to put up with an Excel that has, you know, 1,100 brands on it, we'll share the Excel with them for sure. And that usually, that usually solves that issue. But the pivotal moment for us, if you like, the, 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 the change moment for us, because we were growing steadily, always grew steadily, we've always been profitable. Uh, but the pivotal moment came for us in 2017 when we decided I'd retired from Aer Lingus at that stage. I joined the company as uh, CEO for the first time, even though I was one of the founders, I'd never CEO'd the organization. And 1718, we decided to have a very hard look at who we were, what we had and where we wanted to go, probably in, in that order. And uh, it, the significant pivot for us was that up to then, we only had what, what we now call our lifestyle savings uh, module, which turns over probably, well, I know exactly how much, but circa, or at least <laughs> north, of, north of 30 million, north oh, of 30 million a year right. is the... Is the, is the now that's is turnover, the, of course. That's yeah, turnover. Yeah, that's yeah. the retail sales value of mm-hmm. the stuff that we're, that we're referring through that. It's a very significant uh, opportunity for, for lots of retailers in Ireland, UK, Australia, and USA. But we, what we did in 2017, 18 was we added five new modules. So we became a very much broader employee member engagement proposition. And the five new modules that we added, after you, go on. I was going to say, 
employment engagement proposition. Mm. As they say, or used to say, English that for me. What the yeah. is that? Like, you'll know, you'll know employment is a competitive space. Yes. And productivity is, an exp- is, is, is a competitive space. Agreed. Attendance, uh, uh, you know, uh, presenteeism, all of these things are challenges that organizations work with. And what our modules do effectively, and we measure it, and our clients get real-time data on how it's working and how, how the various modules deployed are positively affecting that, that engagement, is all about getting the employee to value their space and value the products and services that the company puts in front of them, value the well-being tool, value the learning opportunities, value the opportunity to recognise my colleague Connell, for example, for doing a great job aligned with the values of the organisation. They're all engagements, they're all tractions and they're all reasons why I might stay where I am and value where I am. Now, without naming a company... sure. Tell me something. Give me an example of a company that you might have worked with and what they, what you did for them. Yeah. So this has been an interesting couple of months. And actually, uh, I, I just refer back. Uh, you, you did a lovely uh, piece with uh, with the brilliant Des Travers, who whom I wasn't aware of uh, as a, as a, as a person and as a He's leader. Fascinating guy. It was it was absolutely uh, absolutely. Ext- I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. I actually, listen to it a second we'll have time. You back. <laughs> uh, I, I He's a great great guy. Thought it was great. Interview, yeah. But but one of the things that resonated with me the minute I heard it was when he when he talked about uh, sitting down with his management team last March. And, and having this meeting saying, okay, we're going to be down 50% in That's revenue. Right. <laughs> What's that going to look like? And the minute he said it, I actually rang one of my colleagues, say, listen, you should listen to this because this, they went through exactly the same process. So we sat down in March of last year and we said, listen, we've got to look at our clients and we, we are seriously exposed here because we have clients in, in every specter and we have to review, not, not just not making what our, what our ambitious targets were, but actually falling short of where we went last year. And man, it looked horrible. As Des said, or he said it much nicer probably than I am <laughs> saying it, but it looked terrific when you go from 100 to 50%. However, in Des's case, he got it he 100% got, wrong. Yeah, yeah which, was, which was extraordinary. How did it go for you? And actually, and, and that's why I'm trying to put context on this, because inevitably we've had clients who have been really badly Hit. Like we've all been hit. So COVID is bad. There's no, there's no question about that. It continues to be bad. And we had clients who were hit in particular. Retailers, for example, uh, Peter Mark, great, great client of ours, residents here in, in this building, uh, as it happens, I passed uh, one of their units on the way up. And, and there's a business as an example that we were serving that were very focused. The, the, the business owners there are very focused on uh, looking after their team, uh, promoting their team, giving their teams opportunities to develop both personally and professionally. And suddenly they're closed. They're just gone. It's closed. Can't, can't come to work. So we work. That's the kind of client that, that gave us massive gratification in the last 14, 15 months because we were able to provide them with additional tools and additional resources that kept them engaged, that kept the team understanding. I'm a key member of the Peter Mark staff. So what kind of stuff? Well, well, our learning module, for example, which, which Peter Mark promoted heavily, it was already on their, their portal, but they were able to promote it heavily. On our learning module, we have five and a half thousand courses available. 93% of them are available free of charge. And that's across every conceivable, every conceivable personal or professional development uh, opportunity that you want. Literally from dog grooming to Python coding. It's in there. You can do it and you can accelerate yourself, your own personal development, which is 50% of the activity, or your own professional development. So, so they're the kind of things that we had to work with, with clients who were, who were challenged. And then we had other clients, some of, of, of Des's competitors are clients of ours. <laughs> and, and we worked hard with them as they grew their base and as they onboarded new people. So we had this combination of, cha- of working harder with clients because they were challenged and working harder with clients because they were challenged growing, if that, if that makes sense, not just staying still. So, it's so been, Des had to what, hire 850 <coughs> trainers for a couple of Absolutely weeks. Absolutely extraordinary. How he did it. I Absolutely just, extraordinary. Yeah. So the other, so that was the, 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 five, the five additional modules, just to finish that little bit that we added in 2017. So we had the lifestyle piece, the discounts piece, but it's lifestyle. Uh, the five additional modules we added were life, were learning, 
well-being. We've a we've a really innovative, critically important mental well-being tool, which is a really superb online journey a recognition tool. Now, recognition means that you are giving recognition to within, people. Yeah, within you want to the, peer to peer. Yeah. This is it's my John has done a good job. John's yeah. and aligned with the values of the organization. So actually, the organization get a read on okay, we've five values, and you you you'd be familiar with companies having their own versions of them, but they can now measure saying okay, how are we behaving versus what we what we promote as our values, and then we added an, an additional module during the pandemic because. Number of clients came to us saying, "Listen, our team are stuck at home; they can't go to the gym. Have you have you any content?" So we actually built a whole exercise module, and we call it Move, which is now going to have a long history with us because we hired videographers, instructors, and we created hundreds of videos. We created a whole genre of desk exercises. These are three minute exercises yeah. to do to do, desk after, or so I, nah. to do at your desk they tell us all the science <laughs> tells us desk or size. <laughs> yeah all yeah all the all the science tells us that uh, that that you know those breaks those three and four minute breaks are brilliant for Actually, us go back to your 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 piloting just that reminds me of, that used to be a big big thing amongst the canadian air force wasn't it calisthenics calisthenics that, yeah they yeah. Were, they definitely were yeah and so they, and that was Kind of desk exercises. Well, it was to to we, agree. We used yeah. to call it desk desk exercises, not not desk, desk exercises. exercises. You, sir, you get with the get with the plan. <laughs> get with the plan. Going. So that is okay. You're all encompassing now. Who yeah. is your ideal customer? So again, 2017 were seminal for us. Up to 2017, we we um, we boasted, our, certainly internally, uh, that we were winning our clients directly. And you can do that in Ireland, and and you know that, and your guests who who've been in here know that because you can you can find somebody who knows oh, somebody. somebody yeah. You can knock on the door. So, with with that strategy, we've won clients in Ireland from Apple, IBM, Boston Scientific, GE, Musgrave, lots of fabulous indigenous uh, industries here. But that's not a replicable a replicable model abroad. So what we now, this is great because we love tips, insights, mm. and all. So, so what did you? You went to the UK. So we decided that actually the best way for us to expand in the UK, Australia, and in the USA now uh, was to find what we describe internally anyway. What we describe as intermediaries. That's clients who want multiple iterations of what we had. So we looked at where our clients were in Ireland. We looked at where the opportunities was. So we identified very particularly financial services organizations, large brokers, large pension providers, large flexible benefit providers, and said, listen, they they want to engage, back to that word, with their with their customers, employees as much as possible. They want to stay connected with them. They want them to value that that relationship. So by deploying our tools, if you like, in support of that relationship, we win multiple iterations. So the likes of Benefex, AJ Gallagher, Barnett Waddingham in the UK are all deploying multiple, multiple variants of our tools. But how are you getting to them? Because you're not piggybacking from here to there. Correct. So you're knocking on the door? So initially the the knock so the value of the intermediary proposition, there's a couple of values of it. One is you don't have as many doors to knock on. Okay. Because you're knocking on one door to get at 150, 200, 300 clients. So as long as you have the right team, Knocking, knocking on that door, you don't have to have 40 people in a call centre going through that laborious process of the yellow pages and calling every Tom, Dick and Harry to find which one fits. So we very specifically target organisations. And when you do that, you sit down in a room and say, Jack, Mary, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Or Yeah, they, yeah there's... there's, there's that that's a version of it. You know, I wish it was a room. <laughs> like we, we've <laughs> well, we've, we've a, a massively expanded uh, UK team. We've expanded our team by seven people in this year. Not not quite as Des's uh, Des's scale, but but that's a big that's a big lift for us. Yeah. And and uh, six of the seven we haven't met yet. Uh, but but we have that's that's how we've done it. We, you know, it's it's a it's a collective. We agree who we're targeting, and then we work really really hard with those with those clients to support their relationship with their clients. We have our own uh, internal mantra. You'll have heard people and buckets of people have come in here and say, listen, how, how, how important UX is to them and UX on their journey. Well, we've a, we've a variant. It's not, it's not untypical of, a, of, a, of an organization. Like we've a variant on UX and uh, we are variant and it's the formula that, that, if you like, 
drives all of our developments. Ours is UX, which is which you get, plus PX. P's, P stands in that instance for partners. So they're the people. So they're, UX they're, they're user the, experience. Is user it? Yeah. experience. Then the PX, partner experience. Partner experience okay. that's, that's the retailer, the learning people, the, the, the educators, the well-being team. Plus CX, which is the client X, the client experience equals WX because it's the work at experience that we're looking to create throughout that client base. I studied maths and you're giving me a shiver down my spine. Not a, <laughs> not a very happy one. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of X's in there you'd get to grips with. X I equals know, what? <laughs> I, know, I know this is hard to portray on a, on a podcast. If I, had a piece, you know, if I had a piece of paper, it looks cool on a piece of paper yeah. if you put that on top of somebody's yeah. screen. But, it, but, it, but, <laughs> but it's, it's critical for us because we're multi-layered. We're, we're very simple in some ways, but we're multi-layered because... We're a B to B to C business. We're not B to B, which some of your your clients are. You're not, we're not B to C. We're B to B to C. So uh, so that's why that's why we have to be very careful about those components of the work it experience. What can Team GPS X do for you? <laughs> well, I think it, like the I suppose what's what's well I'll, I'll I'll put that back on you in in one sense in the first sense one of the things that 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 we have and actually it's really interesting the location we're in I don't know whether every, all your listeners know where, where this no they don't this is Dublin South FM this based is, in the Dundrum shopping centre penthouse I like to say well, the very very pinnacle of it. it is the pinnacle of it and it's a fantastic facility but we regularly describe ourselves as a Dundrum shopping centre we because ultimately we have a lifestyle saving section we've circa an addressable audience uh, between our various communities. We have an addressable audience of half a million people who shop, or portions of whom, large portions of whom shop with us. So the very first thing I want to say to the Great Business Show team is, if you're a retailer online or offline, if you want to reach 200,000 people in the UK, if you want to reach a growing audience in Australia or a growing audience in, in the United States, we we are a channel that you should look at. That's no right. question yeah. about that. Yeah. We are we are best in market in in terms of sales generation, incremental sales generation across multiple multiple suites. Both both for Irish products, for UK products, because when we're selling, when and when the lifestyle savings module is deployed in a particular country, it's critical that there's local content and local retailers, national ones. So in Australia, we've national ones. In Ireland, we've national ones. But there's also international. So we sell Irish products in Australia. We sell, you know, UK products to our Irish base. So we are a very big retailer. That's the first thing that people forget about us. And we and probably we should shout about it a bit more. And um, we will be doing that shouting for you. Yeah. Come here to me. Hire in a heartbeat. Who would you love? Well. And you yeah, are hiring. I, we are hiring. We are hiring. And I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, Colonel. If Willie Walsh was ah, available, I was thinking that. I bet you, you not, love him. I bet you love him. Well, actually, and, and pro- again, pe- people because he went to the UK, you, you get forgotten in Ireland sometimes. I have interviewed him. I think twice. Have you really? Very, very nice man. Yeah, that's it. That's interesting. Well, I so w- Willie started. Willie started in Aer Lingus the year behind me. In uh, so he would have started in seventy eight. I started in seventy seven, and for a very short period of time, uh, we we actually were on the same. Uh, executive of the Pilots Association, the Pilots Union, to all intents and purposes. Willie, at whatever age he was then, 21 or 22, was already the most brilliant union person that ever that ever crossed the door of the Irish Airline Pilots Association. Which is Association. ironic because then he started fighting yeah. on the other side. Yeah, well, which, is, which is interesting because, he, because, you know, that talent was, was yeah. seen. Yeah. And, and, and Willie moved to the other side and, and was a brilliant manager across his entire career. And, and like, I'm not here to, you know, Willie doesn't need me to, to float his boat. But, but what's really interesting about Willie, and actually it came up recently because we did, and I'm sure you've done this umpteen times, this uh, the psychological profiling. And we did it again for our whole team recently. Part of our wellbeing team, we're doing it and we did it. And inevitably in our business with our 25 people, we've some people who are very strong in vision, others who are strong practitioners, others who are strong in strategy and others who are strong in whatever. Willie is the, and again, he'd be shocked if he even heard I said this, but he is the, the pinnacle of merging all of those talents. He, he can strategize, he can deploy, and he can, he can 
he has vision and not only vision for Willie, which is which was important to him, but vision for how to get there and how to bring those organizations there. Well, there's no way that you can become the boss of BA or IAG no. without being absolutely Correct. top of your class. Correct. So I think Willie Walsh, yeah, not a bad choice. There you go. Peter Jenkinson, CEO of WRKIT, a.k.a. Work It. See what I did? Oh, I'm hot today. <laughs> <laughs> CEO of Work It. Thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Delighted, Connell. Thanks a lot. And that is it from That Great Business Show on this, our 35th episode. My thanks to all the team here at the Dublin South FM podcast studios, including our sound, sound man today. As always, Keith Stars, his colleague Peter Rice will spit on us and polish us up later on, making us the world's best sounding podcast by far. Valerie O'Reilly of Unicorn P or St. Norman Crowley our way. I promise my old buddy Fergus Redahan, who is chair of Workit, that I'd have Peter Jenkinson on. And PR Gillian Daly told me about Samantha King. We us more to you all. And if you know of a great company that should be featured on Ireland's Best Business Podcast, do send producer at thatgreatbusinessshow.com an email and we will take it from there. And that is the same email address if you would like to advertise to Ireland's SMEs. Like you, we're open for business and we would love to have a chat. Please also do tell your friends about That Great Business Show. You wouldn't want them to miss out now, would you? Finally, my thanks to our sponsor, DeFactoShave.com, the world's best shaving oil. Try it for a week and you'll be a forever convert. So from me, Conal O'Moran, until next week, 